I'm with Rocky Mountain Training. We are a training company that is based in Evergreen, Colorado. That's about 30 miles west of Denver, up in the Rocky Mountains. I have been training on FrameMaker for 30 years. I use it. I work on developing templates, and I deliver training classes, along with other Adobe programs that you'll see listed here. I'm also an Adobe Community Forum moderator, which means I stop by the community pages on a daily basis and try to answer some questions that come from users like you. You'll see me there if you haven't already. I want to remind you that this webinar is recorded, so you can definitely watch it again and again if you would like to. You can also reach out to me directly with questions if you would like. You can take advantage of my blog, which is at rockymountaintraining.com slash blog. I have 13 years of Adobe FrameMaker questions and answers from my past students. And as I said, I work on the community forums. You can certainly go to the forum page and you can peruse the questions that have already been asked and answered. And you can ask us your own questions. We welcome questions on the forum page. That said, I want to go ahead and get started with my first webinar, which is an introduction to Adobe FrameMaker. So I'm going to go ahead and close this window. And I'm here to deliver the second of three webinars on using Adobe FrameMaker. We had one about two weeks ago that covered FrameMaker basics. And this one is going to be focused more on the document editing commands, including a few that you may have missed if you're a longtime user. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about the interface again because I think it's a really important part of FrameMaker. You want to set up your toolbars and workspaces to support your workflow. Mine are in good shape for this particular webinar. And then I want to show you a couple of things about FrameMaker that I can control through preferences. Here's the first of three. If I start adding typos to my document, I would expect FrameMaker would flag those with red or green squiggles when I see when it has a mistake. That's not happening right now. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd like to point out to you is that when I zoom out, FrameMaker resorts to what's called greeking. And greeking is where FrameMaker shows us gray lines where it doesn't want to bother with little tiny letters, which take longer to display. Uh, I'm not a big fan of greeking. I prefer to have it turned off so I can see the layout of a document and see what's going on, even if I can't read the text. So that's the second thing I want to point out. And the third thing I want to show you is that I'm using colorful icons on my toolbars as well as on my panels over on the right. Uh, a lot of my students come into class not realizing they can leave those grayscale icons and change the icons to color if they want to. Um, personally, I'm very visually oriented, and so I can find the colored icons more quickly than I can when they're all grayscale. All three of these things, as well as a lot of other information about customizing FrameMaker, are found in Preferences. That's Edit Menu, Preferences. And I'm going to go ahead and just show you three things here. The first one is Greek screen text smaller than seven points. That's the default. And that's why I have those gray lines in the background. If I put in a zero here and then when I click OK, you're going to see little letters appear here, which I think is easier for me to, to see. I'm not trying to edit in that view, just trying to gain information about how that file is set up. The second thing I want to point out is going to be in the interface. Um, over on the right, you can see I have my icon set to colored as opposed to grayscale. As I said, I prefer the colored icons. I can find them more quickly. I've already got them turned on here just to save some time. But if you decide to change your icons from grayscale to colored or back to grayscale, you do have to restart FrameMaker for that change to take effect. And then finally, under spelling, I'm going to come down to spelling options and just note that auto spell check is turned off. I want to turn that back on again. That's going to give me the red and green squiggles that will help me figure out where the typos are when I'm scanning a document. There are a lot of other things you can control on spell check that are all listed right here. I won't go over them all, but if you haven't looked at this before, I do recommend just reading through the two columns to figure out what FrameMaker is looking for and what it's ignoring, and perhaps customizing this to suit your specific spell check preferences. Now I'm going to go ahead and click OK, 
And I expect to see two things happen on screen since I didn't change my icons. One is I do have little letters here instead of those gray lines that's Greeking. And you can see before I even zoom in that I've got red squiggles up here where there are typos. I'm going to come over here and go to Fit Page and Window View, make that a little bit bigger. And you can see where FrameMaker is flagging typos. Now, when you get these squiggles, spell check is as simple as just right clicking and choosing what you wanted from that list. So I can very easily do a spot uh, spell check just by right clicking as long as auto spelling is turned on. But of course you can also run the regular spell check. So I'm going to go ahead and click the orange undo button twice and bring those words back in again. And just point out that I've got spell check docked in my uh, on the far right side of my screen. If yours isn't there you can find it under edit menu spelling checker. And I'm going to zoom in a bit so you can see it. Here we go. So um, when you want to spell check the traditional way, which is the regular check the whole document technique, you click on start checking to start the process. Like any good spell checker, FrameMaker is going to look at this word and compare it to the dictionary that comes with the software. If it doesn't recognize it, it's going to say, I think it's a misspelling. You can correct it by clicking the correct spelling and then clicking the correct button. There's a little bit more, though, that I want to say about this, so let me pause for a second. Um, the first thing that people don't always know is that Start Checking is actually also a skip button. If you're thinking that maybe Provise has two O's in it, but you're not sure, and the person that knows is getting coffee and will be right back, you can actually choose Start Checking, and it will skip the word, and then it will come back to it when it gets there. I have to zoom back out again because I had zoomed in. There we go. Okay, um, so that's a skip button. Now, when it finds a word that's not in the main dictionary, you do have additional dictionaries that you can use. You can ask your uh, network administrator to set up a dictionary that's available to everyone on a shared drive. So if you're in a work group situation where you all have a network drive available, you can put a dictionary with all your industry-specific words on that network drive, and everyone can have access to it. That has to get done by the administrator. But you can also find words. This, again, is a real word. Uh, just not one that's in my dictionary. You also have the option to learn a word. And if you learn a word, it goes into your dictionary on your computer so that anytime you're on this same computer and you're spell checking and it runs across a word that you have learned, it will know that word. Or if that word is very specific to only this document and if it shows up any other time it's wrong, then you would allow in the document. So those are those options for managing spell checker. And then you can always unlearn a word that you've inadvertently put into a dictionary. So four dictionaries in FrameMaker, the main dictionary, a network dictionary. You can learn a word for this computer and you can allow a document to allow that word in this one file but not any other file. I'm going to go ahead and allow that one in document and show you that it comes back to provides again. That's what that skip button does when you click start checking. Uh, this time I'm going to go ahead and correct it. And I'll choose correct. And then FrameMaker up here says that spelling is okay. All right. Um, one more thing about the interface that I want to point out. Um, around 2017, or actually with the release of version 2017, Adobe revamped the menus and they added additional keyboard shortcuts in that right column. The shortcuts that were there all the time were the Windows compliant shortcuts, Control O for open, Control W for close, Control S for save. FrameMaker has had these escape key shortcuts from the get-go. Back in the 80s it had the escape key, sh key shortcuts, but they weren't listed there so people didn't know about them. If you want to use shortcuts, which I highly encourage once you're comfortable getting around FrameMaker, you just need to understand the difference between these two sets of shortcuts. If you're choosing Control S, you hold the Control key and tap S at the same time. But if you're using the Escape key shortcuts, those are sequential. You tap Escape, let go, the letter F, let go, the letter A, let go for Save As. They are case sensitive. So if Caps Lock is on, the shortcut would not work. But if I click out and I try it again, I'll press Escape, F, A, 
there comes my save as dialog box without me having to actually pick up my mouse. I find the shortcuts really handy. And again, I've used FrameMaker for such a long time, I've memorized all the ones that I care about, um, but they are all listed in the help menu, so you can find them again at your convenience. Okay, so um, from here, let's talk about the thesaurus. Uh, the thesaurus is a book you might have on your shelf that helps you find synonyms, words with similar meanings if you're overusing a particular word. Let's say that I don't want to use the word method in this sentence. What I can do is, without getting up and going to my bookshelf, I can just come to the edit menu and I can choose thesaurus. The thesaurus will open up and it will define whatever word you have selected, uh, frequently more than, with more than one definition. It will have synonyms, see alsos. Synonyms are, have the same meaning, see also is not the same but might work. It may also give you antonyms, words with opposite meanings. And these bold words are hyperlinks. So if I click on the word system, which I think would work in this sentence, this system of powering flight, that works. I could just choose replace. But if I'm not sure and think I want to keep looking, I might click on perhaps tool, which doesn't make a lot of sense here, but does show you that some of the screens are more uh, robust. They've got more definitions. And in this case, there's another page of information on tools. If I pick something crazy like chauffeur, which makes no sense here, I want you to be aware that if you drop this menu down, you can see the words that you've looked at. And I went off track when I left system, so I'll go back to system now, pick replace, and that's how the thesaurus works. Now, you can't dock it. You have to close it, and then when you want it again, go back and get it through the edit menu. Okay. So next up, I'd like to talk about some special characters. And for that, I definitely want to zoom in a bit. I think I'm going to go to 300% magnification. That looks pretty good. All right. And let's talk about spaces. So in between the first and second sentence on this paragraph, there is a single space. If I press the backspace key, I will delete that space. If I press the space bar key, I'll add it back in. However, if I try to add additional spaces, FrameMaker's not going to let me. I'm going to press the spacebar key audibly. It's not adding the spaces that I'm asking it to. Now, the feature that's in play is something called Smart Spaces. And this is where FrameMaker is trying to help you, whether or not you want to be helped. Um, in publishing, double spaces are never appropriate. They've never been part of professional publishing. If you're thinking, that's not true, I learned how to double space when I learned typing years ago, that's probably true. Um, but in publishing, you never see double spaces. The double spaces have several variations as to where they came from. The one that has stuck with me is that it, that it came from the IBM Courier Selectric element. That was that spinning ball on the IBM typewriter, the IBM Selectric typewriter. It's a really hard to read typeface, and somebody seems to have thought that if they double spaced out the sentences, it would make that, that typeface easier to read. It didn't, but it's caused generations of people to double space out sentences. If this is a new concept for you, I suggest you pick up anything you were reading this morning or yesterday that you purchased. Not a flyer from a friend uh, or from a local organization, but if you've got a magazine or a book or a newspaper, you don't see double spaces in publishing. They mark you as new to layout. So again, FrameMaker's trying to help you by not letting you have the double spaces. But I've explained this to students who then look me sternly in the eye and they say, no computer's gonna tell me what to do. How do I turn off that feature? So let me show you. I'm going to go to the format menu. I'm coming down to document and I'm going to choose text options. I'm going to go ahead and disable both check marks on the top line and I'm going to pick apply. One of the check marks was smart spaces. And if I now press the space bar one more time, FrameMaker is going to give me the second space. Now the green squiggle is part of spell check. That's FrameMaker saying, I don't think you want two spaces here, let me help you. If you add a third or a fourth or a fifth space, FrameMaker throws up its hands and says, forget it, you're on your own. I'll do it one more time down here. I'm going to add just one extra space and you can see it's, it's flagging it. If I continue with extra spaces, it doesn't care. So that's smart spaces, you can turn it off. 
And then I also want to talk about quotes, but this font that I'm using is a tough one for showing how the quotes work. So what I'm going to do is put in an override. I'm selecting um, these six paragraphs and I'm going to go to my paragraph designer, font properties. I'm going to change the font to Adobe Garamond Pro. And to introduce an override, I simply click apply. Now, if you listen to the recording of my last webinar, I said specifically, I don't use overrides and I really don't use overrides in my documentation. I'm using them here because I want to teach something that's hard to see with Myriad Pro and because I'm going to come back to this with another feature. So I'm choosing apply on purpose this time, but normally if you're watching me work, I'm not clicking apply. I'm choosing update style because I want to update my style definitions. Meanwhile, let's say that I want to put aircraft engine and propeller in quotes. I put my cursor in front and I press shift and the quote and I'll put propeller in quotes as well. And then look carefully at my text. You're going to see that those aren't really quotes. If you're thinking they are, good thing you're here for this webinar. Those are actually inch marks. They're straight up and down. Quotes should have a different symbol for the opening versus the closing. And this is why I changed the font. Adobe Garamond has more pronounced quote characters than Myriad Pro does. And you can see that these are not quotes. You can also see that FrameMaker is flagging them with the green squiggles, still part of spell check. And if you spell check a document, it can find these and correct them for you if they have come in from perhaps a Word document or because you inadvertently turned off the smart quotes feature. Now, I do want to tell you that if you turn these features back on again, and where I turned them off was in Format, Document, Text Options. I turned off Smart Quotes without telling you, as well as Smart Spaces. So they both got turned off. They're on as a default normally. Um, but if you have them off and you turn them back on, it's not going to fix the problem. When I click Apply, the problem is still there. So in terms of dealing with the quote situation, I would just spell check. I'm going to right click and choose the corrected aircraft. That's a true open quote. I'll right click again and choose propeller with the close quote. That will take care of any inch mark quotes that are in your documentation. And then when it comes to the extra spaces, when smart spaces is turned on, you can keep those spaces unless you type next to one of them. If I get in that spacing area and I press the space bar just once, it's going to remove all the extra spaces. Down here, I'm going to press the backspace key just once. It's going to remove all the extra spaces. So if you need to have extra spaces for some reason, but you want smart quotes on, you just can't edit near those quotes. Okay, so that's smart quotes and smart spaces. Now what I'm going to do is talk for just a minute or two about special characters. I'm again going to use an override. I'm going to go to the paragraph designer. I'm going to change the size to 24 points so it's nice and big and you aren't squinting. As I click apply, I'm adding an override. And I can see evidence that there's an override. If I look down here at my status bar, there's a star, an asterisk, in front of the style name body content. That means there's an override. A paragraph without an override does not have a star in front. A paragraph that does have an override does have the star. And no, there's no way to list what the overrides are. You have to know the document to figure out what the overrides are. I get that question a lot. Okay, but meanwhile, let's look at some special characters. Um, the first thing I want to show you is that there is a very quiet button waiting at the end of the quick access toolbar. It's called symbols. And you can choose from any of these presets from the menu. This menu is not easy to edit, so ideally what you're looking for is going to be in here, but if not, I'll get there in a second. So if I want to add a bullet randomly, not as part of his paragraph style, I can just click that bullet character. I'm pressing the space bar. I can add the scent character. I'm pressing the space bar. I can add the copyright character. You get the idea. If you don't have this toolbar on screen and you still want to get to that menu, you can also locate it in the insert menu under symbols. It's the exact same menu. Let's say I want to add a double dagger. I can find it from there and then I can continue on using additional commands from that menu. That's the symbols menu. Same menu both places. 
If what you're looking for is beyond what's in that list, you might consider the character palette. Now, the character palette showed up in FrameMaker at version 9, and it's awkward. Um, I get questions about this on the forums as well and from my students. Um, the idea behind it is that if you need a character that doesn't appear on screen, you can locate the character you want and just double click it. So let's say I want an E with an accent. I'm just trying to get over that E. I'm not sure why it's struggling, but this is part of the, the dialog box. I'm just going to double click it and you can uh, put two in. Uh, I can see I've added that character in place. I could add perhaps an E with an umlaut. And then it's you can't make it bigger. Um, if you click outside, it closes itself. It's not the you know most fun dialog box to work with in FrameMaker, although it is effective and I do use it. But if you're looking for diacritics, I want you to know that there's one other way you can add them that I think is super helpful. Um, you can do with a series of escape key sequences. Remember, the escape key sequences are sequential, one letter at a time. So if I want to have an E with an accent grave, which is the left pointing accent, I can press escape, let go, tap the left apostrophe and the letter E, one at a time. If I want the acute accent, I can press escape, the right apostrophe, and the E. If I want to have umlauts, I could press escape, shift, colon, and the E. If I want a circumflex, that's a little hat, I could press escape, shift, six, which is the circumflex, and then the E. Sorry, that was an S. It only works on the vowels. So let me try that one more time. Escape. Uh, shift six E, but it's all vowels. So if I press escape and left apostrophe A, I'm going to start the whole process over again. There are a couple other characters that I need in my own work. One is the French Sedia, which is a C and a little squiggle on the bottom. If you look at your keyboard and think, well, what could Adobe be using for that little squiggle on the bottom? Think comma. If I press escape, comma, and the letter C, I get the Sedia without having to open up that character panel. And I also need the French Enya, which has a squiggle on top, kind of like a tilde. That's your key. Escape, tilde, N, and I get the Enya. So some of my documents are in other languages, and I have to deal with these diacritics. Uh, it, that's the easiest way for me to put them in. Just look at the keyboard and figure out what sequence would work. So that's a quick look at those various symbols. Um, and then from here, I'm going to just select this and delete it because it's in my way. And then um, I want to talk to you about copy special and paste special. Now, my students tend to think that those two commands work together. In the edit menu, you're going to see you have cut copy, uh, which you've used before, I'm sure. Paste, you've used before. But then there's copy special and paste special. And these two commands don't relate to each other. They're completely independent. They just both live in the edit menu. They both have the word special. Let me start with paste special. Um, you old time FrameMaker users already know how to use paste special because for years when we copy text from Word and we paste it into FrameMaker, it pastes as a graphic unless we remembered to paste special and choose text or we reordered the default pasting options. Adobe has long since fixed this, but let me just show you. If I select this text and I choose Edit Copy, and I click right here and I paste, it's going to paste with the formatting, just as it shows there. But if I come in and I choose uh, Paste Special, then I can paste it as um, rich text format or just plain text or Unicode text, I have options. If I choose just plain text, it's going to come in unformatted. I still do that once in a while. I still want to have unformatted text when I'm bringing it in from another program. Not a lot these days, but just know that it's available. I'm going to delete both of those. So that's paste special. And then let's look at copy special. So let's say that I want this text to look like this heading here. I could go over to my panels and I could come down and I could find my heading one and I could click it and then come back over here and go back to heading one and then come back over here and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's tough on a big screen. I'm going to undo that, undo, undo. So a technique I take advantage of because I think it's quicker is I will copy a character style to the clipboard. I'll do this with the right click this time. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to pick copy special, same as from the edit menu. 
I'm going to copy the paragraph format. And that allows me to simply paste uh, and just hit the paste here. It's not pasting text, it's pasting the style. And I'm a big keyboard person, so I'll do it again here with Control V, which is the shortcut for the regular paste. So you'll see me using copy and paste to assign styles uh, when I've got a whole bunch of them on a page or across several pages because I find it be a little bit quicker. I can also incorporate pasting in the find and change dialog box, which makes it even faster. And I'll get there in just a second. I'm going to undo those two commands. Let me show you that you can also copy character styles. So I've got my cursor in a character style. I'm going to choose copy special uh, character format. And I'll, let's say I want to have the words rocket engine look like that. I'm going to tap control V as in Victor. It's pasting my character style. You can see down here it's now using emphasis heavy. So that's really handy. And then let me show you one more of the four options. Uh, in this table, you can see that my last column is uh, wider than column one. I'm going to go ahead and copy special, and I'm going to copy the table column width. That width is now in my clipboard. If I come to this column and I control V as in Victor, which is my shortcut for paste, it's going to paste that column width. And I'll use that to standardize column widths across multiple tables. I think that's really useful. Okay, so that's copy special and uh, paste special. Now let's talk about find and change. I'm going to go back up to the first page and I'm going to place my cursor on the top line. And find and change again lives in the edit menu, but I've got it docked over here, so I'm opening it up from here. And typically uh, when you are new to find and change, you're going to be doing a text find and change. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm doing here. Um, so let's say I want to find the word spaceship. I would type in spaceship. Notice my lowercase s in spaceship. And then I'm going to scroll back out again and I'm just going to hit the find button. And FrameMaker is going to find the first occurrence of spaceship. I'm not doing anything to it. I'm just looking for it. So I'll hit find and find and find. It says it a lot in here. Here's find. Then notice this one is lowercase. So it didn't care what the case was. When I said find spaceship, it finds it. Um, and I use this feature when I'm entering edits into a FrameMaker document and my uh, editor has removed a big section or they've had a big section and everything from that point reflows and I can no longer figure out where the next typo is. When I'm lost in a document trying to figure out where it went after I've added more content or removed content, I'll use find to type in a couple of words from the paragraph I'm looking at on the hard copy and then I can zip right to it. So I'm, that's one way that I use this. Now, back to finding again. I'm going to go back to page one, click on the first line. If I turn on consider case, that's an option here, and then I hit find, it's going to skip all the ones that have an uppercase because consider case means, hey, pay attention to the case. And that's what's happening right there. Okay, so that's a basic find. Hopefully you know that. Although, let me tell you, I've polled a lot of students and they don't know that command, which makes me a little nervous. Okay, um, they've never used find and change. I think it's such a great feature. Okay, so meanwhile, let's look at find and change now. Um, this time, I'm going to search for 3D. I'm typing in a 3 and a D, and I'm going to choose find, and it finds 3D on page 1. Here's another one. Here's another one. But then it pops to page 8, and it finds 3D as it is embedded in some department names. If I just want to find the ones that are whole words, I just have to go back and enable whole word. And now when I hit find, it will only find the ones that are whole words and not the ones embedded in other words. So again, just look at the controls that are in find and change if you're not using it very often. It's very helpful. Find backwards, as you can imagine, is going to go backwards through the document. Normally it will go forward. Okay, so let's say that I want to change them all to 3D, or sorry, 2D. I'll type in 2D here, 2D. Let me come back above it. Uh, so find is going to locate the first choice. The change will change it and then just sit and wait for you to tell what to do next. I'll hit find again. Um, change and find will change that one and find the next one. And then change all will find all of them in the document. Be careful with change all. We can inadvertently change things we weren't expecting. 
when you change all. You can undo it, so be ready. Or better yet, if you're not sure, I suggest saving the file before you change all. If you're changing all in a book file, which is a possibility, if the files are closed, when you do that, you can't undo. So just be cautious with change all. I've definitely been burned by my own silly mistakes, so I'm um, very careful with it. And one of the rules I've implemented is that I only use change all when I'm doing the first uh, layout of a document because I know my editor is going to read every single word on every single page. I don't use change all when I get to round two and round three edits because they may think I'm only changing what they told me and are not going to look at other paragraphs that they think we're already okay. So that's what works for me. You'll figure it out for yourself, but that's change all. Now, at the beginning of this, uh, I pulled down the find menu. And let me go ahead and just delete the content here because I don't need it anymore. And notice how impressive that menu is. You can look for all kinds of things. If you're in a FrameMaker document going page by page looking for some specific element, you can probably find it more quickly with Find and Change. This is definitely something you want to open up when you have 15 minutes and just play with this a little bit. But let me just show you a couple of choices in here. Let's say I want to find anchored frames. If I choose anchored frame and hit Find, it's going to find my anchored frames. I only have one, so I won't keep clicking it. Um, I could come up in here and I could say, you know what, find any table. And it's going to find my table. Again, there's only one. But there are some more options in there when it comes to tables. I could tell it what table style I want it to be using. Or I could be asking it to find tables that have overrides. And speaking of overrides, you remember I put overrides on the paragraphs on the first page. One of my favorite features in here that's not well known is that it can search for overrides. And there's four of these. It can search for paragraph format overrides, character format overrides, table format overrides, and object style format overrides. I'm dealing with some paragraph format overrides. When I click an override, any of the four, FrameMaker says, and how about if I remove the override? That's what it defaults to. So if I click Find, it's going to locate that first paragraph that I changed to Adobe Garamon Pro. And if I hit Change, it's going to put it back to what it was supposed to be. I'll hit Find. I'll hit Change and Find, Change and Find. And then I'll change all the rest, three more. So Change All. And it says there were three more. And now I put these back to their original formats. And again, I did that because if these char the quote characters aren't so obvious if you're not used to open and close quotes. Okay, so those are some of the character level commands I think you should know about when you're editing. Um, oh, I missed one thing. Sorry, I'm going to do one more thing on editing. Um, I'm going to show you Microsoft Word because Word can show you dots where there are periods, and FrameMaker can't do that at this point. So when I'm given a Word document, and that's how I receive files, so typically coming to me in Word format and Excel and then images, and I've got to put them all together in FrameMaker. At a bare minimum, I can expect that my typists are going to double space out the sentences. We've already talked about that. And they'll also put double returns between the paragraphs. Now, that's at a minimum. In reality, they might give me lots of returns between paragraphs. And for no good reason, they might be adding spaces in there, just because they can. So I'll get documents that have all kinds of weird things going on in them. I started this when I was in my 20s, and I used to, when I was in my 20s and very idealistic, try to get my typists uh, to type the files the way I wanted them to, but those people were probably my age now, and they thought, wow, that 20-year-old's not telling me what to do. So uh, I stopped that because they would get annoyed with me. Uh, and I just accept the files in any format, whether there's a few returns or a lot of returns, whatever it is they're doing. I have learned from laying out files for so many years with so many people that typists, while they do weird things, they're very consistent with whatever that weird thing is that they're doing. So if I can examine their file, I can figure out their pattern, and then I can remove it. Okay, so I put in some extra spaces and returns in here. Uh, I'm going to go to the end of this document and show you what I get in every single file. Uh, everyone gives me files that look like this. They finish typing and they just press return, return, return. I don't know what they're doing. That's just how they come in. Okay, so I'm going to select this. I'm going to choose Control A for copy. I'm going to right click and I'm going to copy this content, take it to FrameMaker, 
and I'm going to go to my spaces document and I'm just going to paste it in. Just hit paste, regular old paste. And you can see the extra hard returns in here because FrameMaker does show you the pilk rows. Those are the hard return markers, but you don't see the dots for spaces in FrameMaker. You can tell they're there though because you can see the big gaps. So patterns. One more thing I want to talk about with find and change before I move on. I'm going to put it back to a text find and change. Uh, FrameMaker has a feature called regular expressions that I think is extremely important. It's a pattern based find and change. If you want to learn more about this, I would love to do a webinar on that someday. You can always ask questions on the forums. We will answer them there. Uh, I, I love regular expressions and I use them quite a bit in cleanup because it makes it really fast. So what I want to do is um, zoom in a bit on this page. You can see what's happening here. And I'm going to type in a regular expression. Backslash H represents a horizontal space. And I want to find one or more horizontal spaces. It could be one, two, three, 5,500, whatever. I want to find multiple horizontal spaces. I want to replace them with a single space. Now you can't see a space in a dialog box. So I'm highlighting it for you. I press the space bar there. So I'm saying find one or more horizontal spaces, put in a single space. And when I change all, FrameMaker is flying through the document, pulling out all those extra spaces so that I no longer have extra spaces between my sentences. I can do it for a single file, I can do it for my entire book, and I usually do it for my whole book. 642 of those is what it found. Um, in addition, I didn't show you this earlier, people often do this, they'll put spaces at the end of a paragraph, don't know what they're doing there. Okay, so there's another thing I do with cleanup. Uh, backslash S, backslash lowercase s, represents a any kind of space. And I'm going to look for any space that appears at the end of a paragraph. The dollar sign means at the end of a paragraph. So if there's any spaces at the end of the paragraph, I want them out. And I'm going to erase the space that's here so it replaces it with nothing. So any space at the end of a paragraph replaced with nothing. And then I'm going to change all. And it's going to run through and track them all down. So very, very helpful for me, those particular commands. Okay, so that's it for find and change. If you've got more questions, let me know at the end, or we can talk on the forums at some point. All right, let me go back to the other file, which is the webinar. Uh, okay, so next up, I'd like to talk about user variables. So FrameMaker supports two kinds of variables, system variables and user variables. System variables are built into the system. They're built into FrameMaker. They're used for things like the page numbers, the running header ones, the running header twos. I explained these in the previous webinar on learning uh, Adobe FrameMaker. So they're in all FrameMaker documents. You can use them, you can ignore them, you can redefine how they behave, but you cannot remove them. Those are system variables. FrameMaker also has user variables, and those are variables that you, the user, think would be helpful. Uh, you can create your own variable, and the reason you want to do that is because you are putting in some content that you know is going to change later. Like let's say right now we're, we're typing this, and we have the word vehicle here, and we want to change the word vehicle to something else. Now you might think, well, find and change can do that for you, but here's the difference. If you use find and change, you have to evaluate the context every single occurrence when you're updating it to change vehicle every time it appears to something else, because maybe vehicles used in a different sense and it shouldn't change. When you're working with variables, you only put them in where you want them to change later. So typical uses of variables and technical documents would be things like product names, product numbers, revision numbers, company names, anything that you're typing in thinking this is going to change next week, next month, next year. If you put in a variable, you can edit the variable definition and it's FrameMaker's job, not yours, to roll through the whole document and update it. So how does that work? Well, you go over to the variables pod and I'm going to have to zoom this in a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. There we go, variables pod. And at the top, I'm going to choose the button to add a new user variable. And I'm going to call this variable a vehicle, V-E-H-I-C-L-E. -E, and I'm going to type in the current definition of 
extra terrestrial space ship and hope I spelled it right. I'm not sure why I picked up the long name. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in there and I'm going to choose create. Now, if I go back to my variables pod, you can see in the pod that all the variables available on a body page, which is where I am right now, are listed on the left side. The ones that have the red gear, those are system variables. They're built into the system. Every file has them. The one with the blue gears are user variables. The user created them. And these two are in the template I'm using. I'm using a template that comes with FrameMaker. But then there's the one I just added. So here's my, my, um, my variable. And to use it, I can just double click it and watch the word vehicle on my screen as it changes to extraterrestrial spaceship. Now, if you click a word in FrameMaker, you can expect to see a blinking cursor. If it's a variable, then it's going to highlight the whole thing all at once. So if you're thinking, why is this whole thing highlighting? It could be a cross-reference, it could be a variable, and you found something special in FrameMaker. But for the most part, it should not um, be obvious to anybody that it's a variable. It's, it's our secret, basically. I know on the last uh, webinar I had some InDesign users here. Let me just say to you that InDesign variables cannot split across lines. So FrameMaker can. And that's a great reason to use FrameMaker if you're going to have variables. InDesign variables will just overprint themselves on a single line. Not cool. Okay. So let's find another one. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead to find and change. Where is it? Find and change. I'm going to put this back to a regular simple search. I'm going to search for vehicle and I'll hit find. So here's my next one. And then I'll go back to variables and I'm going to double click vehicle. Now, the words appear, that word vehicle appears a bunch in here. That's a lot of work. So let me give you a variation. I'm going to select a variable and I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. Regular copy, nothing special about it. Uh, I'm going to copy that to the clipboard and then I'm going to go back to find and change. And while the find list is incredibly long, which you can look for, the change list is actually pretty short. There's not a lot of possibilities, but my favorite one in there is by pasting. What's in my clipboard? The variable. And so I'm saying find the word vehicle, replace with the variable. So when I come up here, well, I'll just yeah, click here and hit find. It's going to find the next occurrence of vehicle, and I can just change it. And now it's a variable. Next one, change it. And then I happen to know this document. I know I can change every single one and not make you watch me do them all one at a time. I'll go ahead and choose change all. And it finds all the rest of them and changes it. So there were 10 more in that document. When I go back to um, the variables pod, you can see the variable I'm using. But when I go to add edit variable, it will show you what pages it's on. And you can see it's on all these hit pages. If I want to spot check them, I can just double click the page number. So here I am on page three, here I am on page six, now I'm down on page seven. So you can see how I've updated all of them. Now here's why we use variables. It's five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, your keys are in your hand and somebody calls and says, hey, could you please change extraterrestrial spaceship to personal spaceship? You're thinking, really right now I wanted to go home. But all you have to do is edit the variable. So I'll type in personal spaceship. You can see I'm changing those words. Now you can see on this page, I've got a variable here and right here. When I update, it's not my job. It's FrameMaker's job to find every occurrence of that variable and change the definition. That's why this feature is so powerful. Yes, find and change can search for things and change to something else, but you've got to watch the context. Um, in this case, you only put the variable in where you want it to change later. Think about product names, product numbers, revision numbers, company names, any content that you know is going to change down the road, put it in as a user variable. All right, good. So next up, I want to talk about cross-references. And um, cross-references will track text and page numbers. And this is not a cross-reference, but it should be. This is just regular old text, uh, just typed in you know, by typing. 
history of flight is on page one, but I type that number one in there, which means if I move this someplace else, that number is not going to change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this text and I'm going to put it back in using a cross reference. So a cross reference is going to get FrameMaker to type out the content for me and keep an eye on it. If the page number changes, FrameMaker can update the page number. If the text changes, it'll update the content. And it does this by using markers. So a marker is a T, a non-printing character, so you don't see it printing a T. Um, currently, there is no marker in front of the H in history, and that's the first one I'm going to do. So there's no marker here. I'm going to go ahead and put my cursor where I want to put a cross-reference to this text, and I'm going to head over to the cross-reference panel, and I'm going to cross-reference the current document. Two types of cross-references. I want to do a paragraph cross-reference because it's a one-step process. And then I'll make this a little bit taller so you can see my catalog. I'm looking for heading one, and when I click on Heading 1, FrameMaker responds by listing all the Heading 1s in the document. I don't have to worry about how History of Flight was worded. I can see History of Flight. And then down at the bottom, this is the formatting. I'm trying to zoom in there for you. There you go. This is the formatting that you're going to be um, using when you insert your cross-reference. The name is called Heading and Page in this case, but what's important is the building blocks that you see underneath. This tells me I'm going to get an open quote, paragraph text, and paragraph text in this case is going to be history of flight, on page, non-breaking space, page none. This is a default cross-reference format. All files have it. So watching those building blocks, I'm going to go ahead and click insert. It does exactly what it said it would do. In quotes, I have history of flight, page, page none, and then notice that marker right there. When you have an unresolved cross-reference, it's because FrameMaker has lost that marker. It's hard to delete the marker, but it's possible. If you were to triple-click this paragraph and press delete, you would remove the marker, and that would create an unresolved cross-reference. The other thing that can happen is you might move a section from one file to another, and even in the same book, FrameMaker cannot follow that marker's movement. So if you move it from one section to another, you will break the cross-reference. You have to come back and say, hey, FrameMaker, I put it in this chapter. You show it where it went. FrameMaker will match up the cross-reference with the marker, and all is good again. I always want to keep an eye on my cross-references on a daily basis while I still remember where I put things or if I deleted things. Um, it, what makes me really nervous is when I have students that say, oh, yeah, I've seen that message for years. I just ignore it. That means they're, they're sending people to pages that don't have the content they're supposed to have on them. So not a good thing. When you have these, these unresolved cross-references, fix them right away. Okay, let me throw a couple more of these in here. So I'm going to put in um, one for overview and insert, enter, one for personal spaceship structure, insert, enter, and I'll put one for awards and acknowledgements, insert, uh, and this looks like it did when you first came in, right before I deleted it, but here's the difference. Now if I were to force the history of flight to the next page, and then I update my references, this number is going to update. Now if you're working in a book, which most of us are in books every day, whenever you update your book, it updates all the references. That's part of the updating. But in a single file, and for the purpose of my demo, I'm going to have to go to the edit menu and tell it to update references. I'm going to say update all the cross references. And when I pick update, FrameMaker says, oh, that's on page two now. I'm going to go ahead and re remove those hard returns. And I'm going to change this to say, oops, let's go here. The long history of flight. Up here, it still says page two. It still says history of flight. When I update my references, it picks up those changes. So that's what a cross reference is all about. Now, more, tr well, those, those are used quite a bit in FrameMaker technical documents, but a more traditional cross reference might be a sentence that says, for more information, see something on some page. And so let me just do a couple of those with you. Um, maybe I want to track um, a heading two. So maybe I want to track spaceship requirements. But I don't want to just have spaceship requirements on page page num. I want a sentence. Well, 
as a default, FrameMaker has sentences included. There's one that says C heading and page. And if you look at my building blocks, there's a capital S and a period at the end. That's a sentence. So if I pick insert, it's going to put in an actual sentence. C spaceship requirements on page three. You can also edit these formats. So if I click on edit format, I can come over here and say, yeah, it's not really the wording I had in mind. I think I want four more information, spelled info, information, comma space C. And do I have two spaces here? Yep. Oh, boy, Barb, not doing much typing today. For more information, C. Okay, so now I'm going to change it and then choose done and then update my references. So you can watch this word change right here, C spaceship, update. And you can see now I've changed the wording to say for more information, C uh, spaceship requirements on page three. And I'm gonna add one more in here. Maybe I wanna reference a my table. So I'll come over here, I'll look for my um, table caption, which is my table title. I'll click it and I want to reference the table, so I'll say reference table number and page. Again, that's a default that's in here. So maybe I want to just edit it so it says C table. And then I'll change it and hit done and update. And this time you don't see it change, so I haven't added it yet. I still have to click insert. There you go. Good. So there we are. Well, there we have it. Um, now, one more note on cross-references, um, and that is that you can work with spot cross-references. A spot cross-reference is a two-step process, whereas a paragraph cross-reference is a one-step process. I'm not going to do two steps if I can do a single step. But sometimes you want to reference something that's in the middle of a multi-line paragraph, and you're afraid. I should add a period here, shouldn't I? Period. Okay, and could be, you're afraid that it's going to, um, the paragraph's going to break across pages. For example, if I put a marker right here to, to track this particular paragraph, and it ends up with the first two lines on this page and the second three here, and what the person is looking for happens to be down here, they're not going to find it. They'll be on the wrong page. And so you can use a spot cross reference to put a custom marker in a multi line paragraph. So let's say here, um, what I care about is the word NASA, and it's way down here. So I can open up my marker box, and I'm going to double click NASA, which will type it in here for me. Now there are a lot of markers in FrameMaker, lots of these T's, and you can see a, a list of markers when you drop down the menu, and you'll notice that FrameMaker is assuming I'm talking about an index marker. I'm not, I'm talking about a cross-reference marker. So I'm going to come back here and say, no, not index, cross-reference. So I'm saying I want to put a cross-reference marker in front of the N in NASA. And when I click Create, it puts a marker right there. And that's going to allow me to put in um, a reference to that marker. So let's say I just say, um, this is random where I'm putting it. I'll put in, I'll, I'll use my um, menu for this. I'll put in an M dash. And then I'm going to put in a cross-reference. And this is going to be a spot cross-reference, which is called cross-reference markers. There's my NASA. And I'm going to choose just plain page, but I'm going to edit it. And I'll add the word C in front, S-E-E -E space. And then I'll change it and hit done and update and insert. So it says C page 2. Now, all of these cross-references are hyperlinks, and if you know how to follow a hyperlink, control alt click you can use that on any of the cross-references. But if you're not great with shortcuts, let me point out that in the top right corner of the cross-reference panel is Go to Source. When I click on Go to Source with this cross-reference selected, I'm going to hop to the page that says NASA, and my cursor is literally blinking right on the end in NASA. So in this situation with a spot cross-reference, FrameMaker is not following the paragraph, it's following the word NASA specifically. Okay. Um, last thought here. 
there are two panels that have the word cross-reference in them. One is cross-reference singular and one is cross-references with an S at the end plural. Cross-references is going to list all the cross-references in a single file. I love this list. This is where I look to see if there are any broken cross-references. If there is a broken cross-reference, I'm going to have a red X here. And the way you break a cross-reference is FrameMaker loses track of the marker. So if I were to just delete these words, which includes the marker, and now that marker is gone, and I refresh, I'm going to get a red X right there. So that's telling me, uh-oh, you broke the cross-reference marker. As I said earlier, I look at this list every single day. I've got a pretty good chance of knowing how I broke a cross-reference if I see it the same day that I did it. If I haven't looked at that in five years and someone says, oh, you got broken cross-references, I'm going to have no memory of what happened. So you want to be aware of that. I'm going to undo that delete to bring the marker back in, and FrameMaker has already found it and matched it, and we're back in business. Okay. So what have we talked about so far? We've talked about various editing commands. We've talked about variables. We've talked about cross-references. Um, let's, um, let's go talk about master pages. So now I'm going to switch gears completely and um, talk about the page for just a few minutes. So um, I discussed master pages in the first webinar but I did not discuss custom master pages. And so I want to show you how to create a custom master page, two ways to assign it, and then we're done. Um, the way this comes up in my classes typically is when we complete designing the basic master pages, the default left and right masters, one of my students is going to say to me, hey Barb, I don't want page the number one on page one. Can we get rid of it? And think about that, that, that question for a second. This is coming from the right master. So if I go to the view menu and I go to the master pages, sure, I can delete that page number uh, variable, but it's going to remove the one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, right? Because it's all the right pages you're using it. So in this particular document, I have two master pages. This one is left, and it says it right down here at the bottom, left one of two. And this one is right two of two, meaning I have two master pages, my default left and my default right you're allowed to have 100 master pages in a single document. So I can add a few more. And I want to add one for the first page. So I'm going to go to the Insert menu, because I want to insert a new master page. And I'll keep my name short and sweet, F-I-R-S-T first. I want to copy it from the right master, the options being copy from left, copy from right, start over, which I'm not going to do. So I'll copy from the right master. And when I click Add, you're now looking at a brand new master page. If I scroll up, the other two are still there, but I'm looking at a new one. And its name down here in the status bar is called First. So let's do a couple things. I'm going to erase the page number. And then I'm going to get my object selection tool. And I'm going to click on that line and get rid of it. And then click on the template frame, which is the big frame in the middle of the page. And I'm going to grab that top middle handle and pull it down significantly to add a top margin. And you know, just enough that you can tell I made a big change to it. Now, do notice that what I just did had no impact on the left or the right default masters. They only change the first master. The deal with custom master pages is that they take a little bit more work than the default masters, which appear automatically. Anything you put on them is going to immediately appear on all the body pages. But for a custom master page, you have to A, decide you want one. Then you have to create it. We just did both those two pieces. And then you have to assign it because FrameMaker still can't read our minds. So if I go back to the view menu and I show you my body pages, it's not using that new master. There are two ways to assign the master page. The first way is manual. And it's quick, so it seems like a good choice in this demo. Um, the command is going to be format, page layout, master page usage. And FrameMaker is saying, OK, which one do you want to use? And I want to use first. And I want to assign it to the current page, which is one. There are way, ways to assign this to other ranges of pages. You can read about these down here. But I want to assign first just to the current page. 
I'm going to click apply. It does exactly that quick and easy. Notice that if I show you my pages two and three and four and five, they look exactly the same. They're using the default masters. When I go back to page one, now it's using a custom. Okay, so that's one way to do it. I'm going to remove it. So I'm going to go back to page layout, master page usage. I'll choose right left, meaning you figure it out, FrameMaker, which is left and which is right. It'll put a right on there. And I'll click apply. And then let's try a second option. This one takes more setup. And I can tell you that a lot of my, my advanced students that come in after you know using FrameMaker forever, they don't know this feature exists. It just must have come out very quietly and people didn't catch it. Um, so this might be something new for you. Um, it's um, the master page mapping table. So what I'm going to do is show you my reference pages. I'll talk more about reference pages in the last webinar, the one that comes up in about a month. Uh, but let me just show you that the last reference page in this document is reference page three of three. It's the index reference page. I have three reference pages in this document. I'm going to go back to the body pages. Now, the automatic technique for assigning master pages is to attach a master page to a particular paragraph style. And it happens through the reference pages, so I'm showing you my reference pages. Here's a little riddle for you to try to figure out. If you look at this page, which has lots of paragraphs on it, it has a heading zero, it has body begin, it has bullets, it has bullet level one, it has body con or has body content, definition term. What paragraph style always appears on page one and only appears on page one? In most documents, it's going to be the main title always appears on page one and only appears on page one. That chapter tile is not going to appear in the middle of the chapter. It's going to be at the very first page. And so that becomes a great candidate to assign the master page to. In this document, it's a H0 underscore heading zero. So knowing that, what I can do is go to my format menu, come down to apply master pages down here, so format page layout, apply master pages. And FrameMaker should complain to me that there is not a master page mapping table. Sometimes it doesn't do it. It didn't this time. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I have my console ready so I can show you. It said very quietly over here, you don't have a master page mapping table. Let me make one for you. Here we go. So usually that console will open, not always. Okay. So let's go back to the body, the reference pages. And sure enough, there is a new reference page at the back of the document. And this reference page is um, something you have to fill in by hand. It says, okay, what paragraph style name would you like to assign the master page to? This one is H0 underscore heading zero. Which master page do you want to assign? You saw me call it first. For the right hand page, I don't have a left hand page in this document, and I want to assign it to a single page. Now, this is fussier than what you saw me do by manually assigning it, but here's the thing you could have many rows of master pages being assigned, and if you use that command, FrameMaker will read this table and do them all at the same time. You also can do this for an entire book. If you have this table in your book doc, your documents that are in your book, then you can assign your master pages while you update your book. I've got one particular document that I work on where the client's very conscious of the page count. And so I don't always start on the right hand page. I start on the next available page, which means my title might be on the right or it might be on the left. I remember getting caught one year where I had the header on, or the, the page numbers at the bottom on the wrong side because I didn't update it. Once this feature showed up, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I can set up my right-hand titles and my left-hand titles with their own master pages. It always works. Um, so in the long run, this is a more powerful feature. Anyway, here we go. Uh, I'm going to go back to the view menu. I'm going to go back to the body pages. And I'm going to go to fit page and window view. And let's go to format, page layout. Now, when I click Apply Master Pages, FrameMaker's job is to go to the reference pages, look for the master page mapping table, read what I told it, 
and then do whatever I said. And now that it's in there, I can use that command whenever I need to. And I can do it for an entire book and there can be multiple rows. I remember somebody on the forum saying, I need to add another page for my master page mapping table. Meaning she had filled up the entire first page with rows and she had another set to do. We gave her an answer. She did it, said it worked great. You know, sometimes I learned from other people, you know, how powerful the software is. And she was one of the ones that showed us you can have a lot of master pages assigned through that mapping table. Okay, on that note, I am done. So I want to say thank you for coming to webinar number two. I'm going to stick around to answer some questions. So if you've been uh, asking questions while I was presenting, you may have already had them answered. If not, I'm going to come back and try to help you now. Again, I'm Barb Binder. I'm with Rocky Mountain Training. And thank you so much for joining me today. I must have clicked a link. Anyway, uh, you could definitely welcome reach out to me directly. You're really get better off probably looking at my blog, uh, which is free, and you can look at any point. You can ask questions through the blog. But your best bet is going to be the, the framework reforms because I'm just one of several people who are on there on a regular basis answering questions. I do love the questions on numbering, so if you get stuck on numbering and you can't figure it out, let us know. If, I, if I'm the one that sees it, I'm definitely going to be answering it for you. As I said, I try to get on every day if I'm not traveling or in class all day. Okay, thanks you, thank you all very much. I'll see you at the next webinar. It's Barb Binder, Rocky Mountain Training. Bye.